Well, it's time to begin. Uh, let's start with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for another opportunity to be together and to study your word together. I pray that you'll help us to um, read and understand the uh, the book of Acts, understand the history of the church and, and uh, the pattern that you left for your church that we might follow, that we might be pleasing to you. We pray that you'll help us to be um, uh, uh, diligent and um, dedicated to following that pattern and to doing what we need to do to be right in your sight and not trust in our own understanding, but to faithfully perform what is in your word. We pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. We're in Acts chapter 9. We um, most recently, uh, well, recently we were talking about the, the first martyr of the church, which was Stephen. And then there's a guy named Saul that was uh, standing, standing around, milling around while Stephen was being stoned. Um, but he wasn't just there milling around, he was actually consenting, agreeing with what was happening there, um, agreeing with the execution of Stephen. And he agreed so much that he decided he should uh, continue to persecute the church after that. And then we kind of leave Saul at that point. But we really don't leave Saul because... The, the whole point of chapter 8 is to show what happened as a result of Saul's persecution. And that is that the, the gospel is spread beyond Judea into Samaria. Um, at, as we see Philip going into the city of Samaria to proclaim the gospel. And then, um, and then we have the Ethiopian eunuch after that. So we... We kind of leave Saul aside for a second, his person, just to see what's happening as a result of, of what he's doing. And now in chapter 9, we're going back to Saul. We're going to see what happens to him. Um, so let's read chapter 9. And I'm going to focus mainly on uh, this passage about Saul. There's some, uh, some things in here about uh, Peter toward the end of the chapter, and uh, I'm going to stop before we get to that. So, for now, let's read verses 1 through 31 of chapter 9. But Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem, Now as he went on his way, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him. And falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice but seeing no one. Saul rose from the ground, and although his eyes were opened, he saw nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And for three days he was without sight, and neither ate nor drank. Now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Rise and go to the street called Straight, and at the house of Judas look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. For behold, he is praying. And he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias departed and entered the house. And laying his hands on him, he said, 
Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road by which you came, has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes, and he regained his sight. Then he rose and was baptized, and taking food, he was strengthened. For some days he was with the disciples at Damascus, and immediately he proclaimed Jesus in the synagogue, saying, He is the Son of God. And all who heard him were amazed and said, Is not this the man who made havoc in Jerusalem of those who called upon this name? And has he not come here for this purpose, to bring them bound before the chief priests? But Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving that Jesus was the Christ. When many days had passed, the Jews plotted to kill him. But their plot became known to Saul. They were watching the gates day and night in order to kill him. But his disciples took him by night and led him down through an opening in the wall, lowering him in a basket. And when he had come to Jerusalem, he attempted to join the disciples. And they were all afraid of him, for they did not believe that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared to them how on the road he had seen the Lord, who spoke to him, and how at Damascus he had preached boldly in the name of Jesus. So he went in and out among them at Jerusalem, preaching boldly in the name of the Lord. And he spoke and disputed against the Hellenists, but they were seeking to kill him. And when the brothers learned this, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him off to Tarsus. So the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria had peace and was being built up and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, it multiplied. All right. Amazing, amazing story. Uh, one of the Bible's biggest turnarounds, uh, you, you might say, the, uh, the story of Saul's conversion. And, I mean, think about it. Here's a man who utterly despised the name of Christ and the people that followed Jesus. Um, now, I say the name of Christ. He didn't despise the name of the Christ. He just didn't think Jesus was the Christ. He was looking for the Christ, just like all the, all the Jews would have been, looking for the Christ or the Messiah. But he despised the name of Jesus. He despised who Jesus was. He despised the idea that he was the Christ. And he despised... Uh, whoever it was that followed Jesus and proclaimed him. Um, and so, we at the beginning of our story, we see that Saul obtains a, a warrant uh, or, or letters from the high priest to go to Damascus, letters to the synagogues. Now, as we go through, there are three accounts of Saul's conversion. Uh, this is the account that, that Luke gives us in Acts chapter 9. And then Luke records two accounts where Saul, or Paul, as he was called then, describes his own conversion. Uh, that's Acts 22 and Acts 26. So as we go, I'm going to kind of fill in some of the details from those other two accounts so we get the whole, whole picture, hopefully. Um, okay, so he gets these letters from the high priest, and in Acts 22.5 he says the high priest and the whole council of elder, elders. We kind of understand that that's one one big group of authority there in Jerusalem. It says he was breathing threats and murder against the church. And so he takes this letter, he he gets these letters, and it says they're letters to the synagogues at Damascus. Why would they be to the synagogues? Who met at the synagogues? Who, who, who was at the synagogues? Who did you find at synagogues? Okay. Uh, well, the priests were in the, in the temple, but in the synagogues in Damascus and other, other cities, synagogues is where who, who worships? Jews, right? Okay. We have synagogues here in St. Petersburg, and it's where the Jews go to worship, right? Um, so, Why would Paul... Paul's looking for who? Christians. So why does Paul go to the synagogues? Okay, right. Because these are all Jewish Christians, right? So far, 
uh, and in Damascus especially, they would have been Jewish Christians. And so they probably would have still met at the synagogue with their, with their fellow Jews. Um, and they would have been known to the leaders of the synagogue as those of the sect following Christ or following Jesus. Okay, And so uh, presumably that's why these letters were to the synagogues so that the leaders of the synagogue could say, oh yeah, that, that's those people over there. And you, you take them away. We're tired of them. Um, and so, uh, and so or, or perhaps maybe even the leaders of the synagogues would have defended against uh, them being taken away. And so this is authority from the high priest to say, no, Paul has this right to take them away and take them to Jerusalem. Um, all right, so the letters say, that if he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. What is the way? Christ. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Why, why Why do they use that name, the way? Where do they get that from? Right? Jesus said it. So it seems as if perhaps this is what the disciples were calling themselves. The way. Um, Why don't we call ourselves the way? Why do we we have the name Church of Christ on the front? Not the way. Mm Mm-hmm. Is there any is there any problem with the name Church of Christ? No, it's descriptive. It describes who we are. It's a name we find in the Bible. Um, and it, what about what if we changed our name to the Way? Yeah, it's still a description of Christianity. With, so it's still biblical. So would there be any problem with that? With us calling ourselves the Way? Right. Okay. So, so there, there's the answer. Is it gets confusing, right? So, so typically churches such as ours choose the name Church of Christ so that we can find each other. It's it's really kind of a uh, a utilitarian kind of thing. Um, although I, I suspect that there are some who who see it as more than that, and and they've kind of um, let that tradition become part of their faith. Uh, but you know, it's just and it's just a thing for us to to think about. You know, why why do we call ourselves the Church of Christ as opposed to the Way Church of God? Well, we'd really be confused if we call ourselves Church of God, uh, and you know, and and so on and so forth. So anyway, moving on. Um, so now he is going to persecute the Way, and he's on the way to Damascus, and suddenly this light from heaven shines around him. All right. Uh, what time of the day was it? Turn to Acts chapter 22 and verse 6. Hmm? Right, noon. And in Acts, um, uh, let's see, Acts 22, 6 says... As I was on my way and drew near Damascus, about noon, a great light from heaven suddenly shone around me. And in in Acts 26, he says it was at midday. So, same thing. Um, And then in Acts 26, he says to King Agrippa, it was a light that was brighter than the sun. Well, it would have to be for him to notice it. um, Because it was noon. The sun would be directly overhead. And so, this was an exceedingly bright light. Um... So, is it possible that there was some advanced, you know, Greek technology that was able to produce a light brighter than the sun? Yeah. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Okay. All right. So, let's talk about that. All right, so so I think we're all in agreement that this is extraordinary that this light appeared and it, in, in the middle of the day that was brighter than the sun at this time. Now today, no problem. We we could produce light greater than the sun 
in localized areas, no problem. Uh, probably wouldn't be very comfortable to stand under, but you know that's <laughs> uh, wasn't very comfortable for, comfortable for Saul either. Um, and so this light. Well, well, we'll talk about um, we'll talk about what uh, Keith's comment in just a second. Let's let's talk about what happened first. There is this light that shines around, and it says it's shone around him. And in chapter twenty six, it says uh, that it's shone around those who journeyed with Saul as well. Okay, twenty six thirteen. So this is the scope of this light, and. Um, it, in chapter 9, it says, uh, he fell to the ground. And verse 4. And then in chapter 26, it says his companions fell to the ground as well. In chapter 26 and verse 13. So the light shines around them. They all fall to the ground. And it's the middle of the day. Um, and so then there's this voice. And the voice says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Um, and in, in chapter 26, Paul says the voice was speaking in Hebrew. All right, so this would have been a language that he recognized as a, a language for his people, right? Um, and so a voice from heaven speaking the language of his people, uh, it's got to be, it's got to make you think, well, this is from. God, light shining brighter than the sun at noon, language from heaven speaking the voice of God's people. And, you know, it's kind of hard to uh, think that this isn't anyone except for God. And he recognizes that authority because he says, Who are you, Lord? Now, I skipped over something. In chapter 26, he says, the voice says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. What does that mean? Why? Wow. What's a goad? The King James says pricks. Anybody ever heard of an ox goad? I had to look it up. I'm not a farmer. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so so it's a it's like a sharp stick that you use to poke the animal and get them to go the direction you want them to go, right? And uh, what I read is that sometimes they would they would use this for oxen, and sometimes they would poke the ox, and the ox would rebel and kick at the goad. And what would happen if they kicked at the goad? It would it jab further in. Yeah, so that's what Jesus is saying. It's hard for you to kick against the goads. You're kicking with all your might, Saul, and you're only hurting yourself. You're only hurting yourself. Why are you persecuting me? And Saul says, Who are you, Lord? He recognized the, the authority of that voice. And in all the accounts, it says, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. Well, duh, you just said, Why are you? Why are you persecuting me? I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. Um, just, just to make sure Saul understands who he's talking to. And in chapter 9 it says that uh, the voice said to rise and enter the city you, and you will be told what you are to do. Very short and simple. In chapter 22, Paul asks, according to that account, what shall I do, Lord? And he says, rise and go to Damascus and there you will be told what to do. Um, in chapter 26, Jesus has a little bit more to say. Let's turn over to there. He says, Who are you, Lord? I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. And he says, in verse 16, But rise and stand upon your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose to appoint you as a servant and witness to the things in which you have seen me, excuse me, and to those in which I will appear to you, delivering you from your people and from the Gentiles to whom I am sending you, to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. All right. 
Now, one thing that we have to keep in mind in these three accounts, there are three different accounts with three different purposes. Um, just like the Gospels, there are four different accounts of Jesus' life. They don't have the exact same information in all four. They serve different purposes and they cover different aspects of Jesus' life. Same with these accounts. This, this particular account in Acts 26 is very brief and he's uh, presenting a defense before Agrippa and he's trying to be succinct and get to the point which is that he was sent for this purpose and the purpose was to be a servant and witness to the things which he has seen um, to those and to those in which I will appear to you um, to be delivered from his people the Israelites and the Gentiles and to be sent to the Gentiles, to open their eyes, uh, to turn from darkness to light, to turn from the power of Satan to God, and to receive the forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by me. All right, so this is what uh, Paul says, Jesus said, and his point is in verse 19 of chapter 26, Therefore, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision, but declared first to those in Damascus, then in Jerusalem, and throughout all the region of Judea, and also to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God, performing deeds and keeping with their repentance. And so his point is, this is what Jesus sent me to do, and that's exactly what I did. My, my purpose is not to subvert and uh, rebel against the Romans, to cause trouble for the Roman kingdom but to bring people to righteousness and to Jesus and to the truth. And that's what I've been about, King Agrippa. Okay, so what he does, we'll see that some of this language is in, in Acts 26 is some of the same things that we see Jesus telling Ananias. And more than likely, Ananias told to Saul. And so Saul is just kind of distilling all of that down for Agrippa in Acts chapter 26. And, and that's the end of the account in Acts 26. So we can, we can leave that, that alone from now on and just focus on 9 and 22. All right, so at this point, we have Saul, light, bright light, making all of them fall down. Um, Saul is, is blind. Well, actually, we haven't got to that yet. Uh, bright light, making them all fall down. Jesus speaks, why are you persecuting me? Um, go to Damascus and I'll tell you what to do. It says in verse 7 of chapter 9, The men who were traveling with me stood speechless. They heard the voice, but they saw no one. Okay? So, we, they heard the voice, but they saw no one. Alright, it leaves you with the impression that they understood the voice. But, if you look at chapter 22, it says... <clears throat> Um, let's see, where was it? I'm sorry? Is it? Yes, oh, yes. Verse 9, those who were with me saw the light, but did not understand the voice of the one who is speaking to me. Okay, so we get a little bit more information there. They saw... Uh, yeah, well, you know, I guess that's one possibility... Although they were coming with him from Jerusalem, um, but you know, I don't know. Maybe they maybe they weren't all trained in Hebrew back then. Who knows? So maybe they didn't understand Hebrew, uh, but maybe they heard the voice, but they didn't understand a word that it was saying. Um, but they did see the light. Now, were they blinded by the light? No. How do we know? All right, exactly. Yeah, they let him down the road. They didn't fall into a ditch or, you know, off a cliff or anything like that. So apparently the the, the companions maintained their sight and they led him into Damascus where he stayed and he didn't eat and drink for three days. All right, so we're, we're going to leave poor Saul for a second. Not eating and drinking. Let me ask you this. What is the point of making Saul blind? Yes. Okay, so now we have an opportunity 
for a disciple of Christ to perform a miracle directly on Saul and give him sight. Is there any is there any kind of um, metaphorical you know meaning to this? Do you think? Yeah. Right. Okay. All right. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Right. Okay. Right. So we have so we have that the opportunity for him to receive the miracle is not Saul blind already in some sense. Okay. Dark. Yeah. Essentially blinded to the truth. Right. So, so just because he saw the light doesn't mean that he can see. Go ahead. Yeah. So, so there, there may be something to that. You know, I don't want to stretch it too far. Um, okay. Let's let's go back a little bit. Yes. Sit. Exactly. Now, let's talk about the light just for a second. I, I meant to ask, what is the significance of this bright light shining? Does it... The life. I think he says the life. But, he's, uh, he's the light of the world. The very first words God speaks, let there be light. Psalm 119, 105... Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. You know, lots of things that perhaps would have been going through Saul's mind as this bright light shone from heaven and he heard this voice. Um, Light is certainly associated with the truth and with God and with Jesus. Um, Okay, so he goes to Damascus and he's blind. He's not eating. Uh, Blindness, I think, also would have given him a chance to uh, to contemplate, yeah, to think, meditate. Uh, that's just my feeling on that. Um, that's why we uh, sometimes people close their eyes to to think really hard. You know, I don't know. Um, that's just me talking. All right, so. Um, uh, let's see. So Saul rises from the ground. His eyes are open, but he cannot see. And in chapter 9, he, uh, in verse 11, no, I'm sorry, 22, verse 11, he blames the brightness of the light for that. His companions lead him into Damascus. He doesn't eat for th- uh, and drink for three days. Okay, and then we're done with Saul. Now, now we move to Ananias. Ananias, who was Ananias? How does it describe him in verse 10? Disciple, all right? A disciple. All right, so we know him as disciple means he's a follower of Christ, okay? Um, That's the implication there because Luke is writing that and he's a disciple and he's writing two disciples. Uh, But then if we look at Acts 22, Paul has a little bit more to say about Ananias. He says in verse 12, Ananias, one Ananias, a devout man according to the law, well spoken of by all the Jews who live there, came to me and standing by me said to me, Brother Saul, receive your sight. So, not only was he a disciple of Christ, he was also devout in the eyes of the Jews and according to the Jewish law. Why is that important? Now, in Acts 22, Paul is preventing a presenting a defense before the Jews. Okay. 
Okay. All right. And so, and so Paul is trying to, to make the point in Acts 22, as he's making his defense, that there, none of us are against the Jews. None of us are against the law of Moses. We are Jews. We're devout Jews. The person that baptized me was a Jew and a devout Jew. And all of you know who he is. Um, Or at least everyone in Damascus knows who he is and knows his reputation. Uh, Okay, so that's why he brings that forth in Acts chapter 22. Again, different audiences, different uh, points to the story. So, the Lord appears to Ananias and tells him to go find Saul. He tells him where he is, and he tells him that Saul is expecting him. He's received, he's, he's seen a vision, Saul has, of Ananias restoring his sight. And, I, and I'm sure Ananias thought, I'll bet Saul's expecting me. <laughs> uh, he's doubtful. Can you blame him? I mean, everybody knew who Saul was, Right? Apparently, it was no secret that Saul was coming to Damascus to persecute the church. And here, the Lord says, go see Saul. Well, that doesn't sound very smart. But uh, the Lord reassures him. And he says, um, go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. Um, a chosen instrument. Well, that's why Jesus appeared to him, because he had a plan for Saul. Um, This man who was persecuting him, who was doing everything he could to get rid of uh, the disciples and to make sure that this way didn't uh, prosper, um, Christ had a plan for him, even him. Okay, so, he says in verse 19, I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. Did I say, I said 19. Sorry, my eyes are a little fuzzy. (laughs) I should put on my glasses. Um, Okay, so that's a significant thing. How much did Paul suffer for the name of Christ? Mm Mm-hmm. Shipwrecked stoned, left for dead, right? Marooned on islands, you know, well, that's a shipwreck, I guess. Okay, um, imprisoned, you know, so on and so forth. All suffered a lot. And, th- and this, is, this is what Jesus says, I'm going to show him how much he's going to suffer for my name. <coughs> and it seems... I, I don't know why he says that. I don't know if he's trying to make Ananias feel better about the whole thing, that, you know, yes, Saul has made Christians to suffer, but now he's going to have to suffer. You know, I, I don't know. That doesn't sound right to me. Um, but it's probably just Christ, uh, the Lord, saying, you know, this is real, Ananias. This, this is going to happen He is going to be a devoted disciple, and so you need to go uh, speak to him. Um, He is a chosen vessel. All right, and so he says, He will carry my name before Gentiles, before kings, before the children of Israel. And we see that in the rest of the book of Acts, and even in Acts 22 and 26, we see him carrying the name of of Jesus before uh, the the children of Israel. In Acts 22, and before Kings in Acts 26. So those two passages um, show the fulfillment of this word of, of Jesus. All right, so Ananias is convinced. He goes to Saul. Um, and chapter 9 says, uh, The Lord Jesus that appeared to you on the road sent me and uh, regain your sight so that you can regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And so, how did he regain his sight? All right. And so, uh, uh, yeah, something like scales. And in chapter 22, it says that, 
Well, well, first of all, Jesus said, lay your hands on him. So we assume that that happened. Um, oh no, it, it says here in verse 17, laying his hands on him, that's what he said. Uh, so he laid his hands on him. In chapter 22, it says that he was standing by Paul and said, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And so then the scales fall off. All right, so that's the receiving, regaining his sight. How is he filled with the Holy Spirit? Okay, he rose and was baptized. So he repented and was baptized and he received the gift of the Holy Ghost, just like Peter said in Acts chapter 2. Um, this is this is what Ananias is saying, right? Um, now, why was he baptized? Let's read Acts 22. And see what else Ananias said, according to Paul's account here. <clears throat> and he said in verse 14, The God of our fathers appointed you to know his will, to see the righteous one, and to hear a voice from his mouth. For you will be a witness for him to everyone of what you have seen and heard. And now, why do you wait? Rise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name. So, Ananias commanded him, said, Rise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name. So that's why he was baptized. Uh, because Ananias told him that's what he needed to do. What sins did Saul have? <laughs> well, I mean, really. Who Saul did everything for what purpose? Exactly. And, and, right. Right. So, did Saul have any notion in his head that he was doing anything wrong? As a matter of fact, right. As a matter of fact, he thought everything he was doing was exactly what God would want him to do. And uh, that he was going, well, I don't want to say above and beyond, but he was doing exactly what God wanted him to do. All right. So, so, so what sin did he have then? Um, at one point, and I was I was just looking at this, I forgot to, to look it up. He says, uh, I have lived in all good conscience until this day. This was later on in the book of Acts. And uh, the high priest commands him to be slapped for it. Um, because he doesn't believe him. It's such a such an outrageous statement to say, I have I have never violated my conscience. So, mm hmm. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. So, was that a sin? Okay, all right. Right. Paul points to this very thing as the reason that he is one of the chief of sinners because he persecuted the church. Um, and it's time for the first bell if someone would uh, ring that for me. Um, okay, so and so that's, that's a, the point we want to make is that Sincerity does not equal righteousness. Okay? Um, doing what, doing truly the will of God equals righteousness. And so Paul had it in his head that this was the will of God. But was it? 
No, obviously not. Okay? And so it is incumbent upon us to understand the will of God so that we do it. Not just to go off on our own and say, well, I think this is what God wants me to do, or I am just sure God would want me to do this, and so that's what I'm going to do, and I know God will be pleased with me. Well, why? Why, why do you know that? Have you looked at the word that He gave you so that you understand what it is that God wants you to do? That's the only way that we can be pleasing to Him. And so once He was, uh, once he, uh, he was relieved of His blindness, both physically and spiritually, He went immediately to the synagogue in Damascus. And, you know, why would he do that? Shouldn't he wait and learn learn more? You know, become, become a little bit better Christian, know a little bit more about what that means to follow Christ before you go and try to talk to people about Christ? Well, that could be. Yeah, that could be. But, you know, he knew everything that he needed to know to be able to talk to these Jews about Christ and to be able to proclaim He is the Son of God. How did He know that? Because He appeared to me on the road to Damascus. And He told me. Okay? That's what He needed to know to explain to others about Jesus and to try to convince them uh, that the Gospel was real and the Gospel was the will of God. Okay. Uh huh. Okay. Okay. Yeah. It, well, eventually they were ready to kill him because they. Why? Because they had the same problem with him as the Jews in Jerusalem had with Stephen. They they couldn't. You know, they were confounded. Paul confounded the Jews, it says, uh, that he proved that Jesus was the Christ. Can we prove that Jesus was the Christ? Well, Paul did. I have a feeling we we could too, uh, if we tried. Um, Alright, so the Jews in Damascus get tired of Saul and they plot to kill him. Uh, Saul finds out about it and so they let him down out of a window of, of the... Um, of the city wall by night, and he escapes to Jerusalem. And he has a little trouble there in Jerusalem because he tries to join with the disciples. And what happens? How do the disciples feel about Saul? Well, oh, welcome, Saul. We're so glad you're converted. <laughs> right. And until what? Okay. All right. So, so just like Keith was saying with Ananias, Barnabas takes Saul and says, "No, look, this guy is for real," uh, and takes him to the apostles. It says, um, explains how he saw Jesus on the road. Basically, he was a witness for him and defended him. And so then he was able to go in and out among amongst the disciples and proved himself at that point because what did he continue to do in the temple? He continued to preach. He spoke boldly in Jerusalem. It says he disputes with the Hellenists. I have a feeling these are the same people that led to the stoning of Stephen. Remember we talked about you know all those special Jews that came to Stephen and started arguing with him? And some were called Alexandrians and some were from um, uh, Asia and, and other places. Not from Jerusalem. I have a feeling that that those are the Hellenists. I'm not sure about that, but um, it's a good story anyway. And, and so, um, so they sought to kill Paul as well. So he can't catch a break. Um, all he's trying to do is preach Jesus, and now people are trying to kill him. Well, you know, turn around is, <laughs> you know, that's that's the turnaround, right? Exactly. And, you know, he had to know that was going to happen. 
Uh, okay, so then uh, the disciples bring him to Caesarea and send him to Tarsus, which is apparently where he was from originally, so send him back to his hometown. And at that point, we kind of lose track of, of Saul for a while. Uh, but the church has peace and it says they're built up uh, and they're walking in the fear of the Lord and because of that, they multiply. And so I think that's a very important thing for us to, to recognize is that it's not just that, you know, because they had peace, because there was no turmoil or, or, or persecution that caused them to grow, but the fact that they walked in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit. And so that's what's important for us. Whether we have good times with no persecution or uh, hard times where you know we're persecuted right and left, that's what we have to do if we want to continue to grow and to multiply um, and to be the church that, that uh, Jesus would have us to be. All right, and so that is the uh, end of our story. The story of Saul's conversion, we're going to pick up with Peter, and uh, we're going to talk about the first Gentiles being converted uh, on Sunday. I... Yeah, I I think uh, I think so. I mean, you know, uh, otherwise why did why wouldn't Jesus have just come to him in a vision at night, or you know, just spoken just spoken to him and said, you know, li- you need to you need to listen to me. Um, there had to be something dramatic, something that Saul could not ignore, um, because yeah. Yeah, and, and there were witnesses to say, yeah, there, this light, you know, it was real. We saw it. We heard this voice. Didn't have any idea what it said, but there was a voice, you know. And so Saul couldn't say, ah, you know, that's all in my head. You know, I should have, you know, shouldn't have eaten that last piece of bacon. Or no, 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 there was no bacon. Saul would not be eating bacon. Uh, <laughs> but, <laughs> but but it got it. Yeah, it got his attention. It made him stop. It made him stop what he was doing, make him so he couldn't continue because he was blind, um, and and forced him to take a look, ironically, at himself and his own condition, um, and and his own misconceptions about Jesus. Yeah, very good point. All right, any other questions or comments? All right, we'll leave it there then. Pick up on Sunday with uh, the end of chapter nine.